people down through the centuries have, with the most amazing consistency, divided themselves into two groups. One group contains about 5% of any given population. The other group contains the remaining 95%. Neither of these two groups is any better than the other. But one thing separates them. The big group, the one containing about 95% of the people, never seems to get the word, while the smaller group, the 5%, does. Now, what do I mean by getting the word? I mean about 95% of the people never quite understand, emotionally or intellectually, that we as individuals control, to an altogether unsuspected extent, our lives here on earth, that each one of us is the architect of the structure fashioned by our years. You see, all of us want the same things, but only about 5% figures out how to get them. Within each of us burn two unquenchable ambitions, to serve importantly and to gain financial independence. Both of these worthwhile goals are within the reach of all of us, man or woman, but according to statistics, only about 5% achieve both of them. Why? Let's look at it logically. Every human being has a tendency to think, act, and talk like those by whom he is surrounded. This is environment, and it exercises an enormous influence on our lives. We've already pointed out that 95% don't seem to get the word in life. Then it follows that in the case of any given individual, the odds are 95 to 5 that he is surrounded by the larger group. And since a body in motion tends to remain in motion until acted upon by an outside force, that he will continue to conform to his group unless we can do a better job of serving him through knowledge. The failure of most people to live successfully is not caused by their lack of abilities, far from it, but rather in their failure to decide what it is they want and understanding that our wants are governed by our talents and abilities and that we are divided into two groups of roughly 5% and 95%, and that it's the 5% group which is successful. So here, let me give you a definition of success which, to my mind, covers the subject completely. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. That is, anyone who knows where he is going in life is a success. At the moment he makes the decision of what it is he intends to accomplish, of what it is he considers a worthy ideal, he is successful. Once this goal has been accomplished, he is again, by our definition, a failure until he establishes a new goal toward which to work. To my mind, this is what we as human beings were intended to do, to go through life from one achievement to another and to finally come to the end of our road here on earth, still reaching, still working toward a new and better plateau on which to stand. For this is to live and live completely, to know as much as we can know, to serve as much as we can serve, to accomplish as much as we can accomplish. Well, since success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal, why are we faced with only 5% who can be called really successful? Because the best estimates available tell us that only about 5% will ever decide upon and define the one thing they want, one thing because we can only do one thing at a time. To my mind, the story of a person's life is the story of a, a quest, a search to which he devotes his life. We know that the happiest people on earth are those who know exactly what it is they seek and set boldly out to find it. And while we're all dreamers, the fortunate ones are those who have found a dream so exciting and worthwhile that they'll devote a part or all of their lives to making that dream come true. But while all dream, by far the great majority, that 95%, never realizes that a persistent daydream is often the point on which we should set our compass, the place toward which it is meant for us to journey. The tragedy is that the great majority shrugs off this built-in direction finder and returns to the wide, visible, well-marked road in life which they feel must be the best road because it carries the heaviest traffic. Well, let's make this point clear. The road in life with the heaviest traffic is not the best road to follow, for it is the road of the 95%. It is the road with no more opportunity and with 19 times as much competition. Of all the billions of human beings who've lived on earth, all great advances, all great ideas have come from just a handful, a few thousand out of billions. Now, how have the people as a group reacted to the great ideas? Every great leader and thinker from Socrates to the Wright brothers has been scorned, ridiculed, poisoned, imprisoned, stoned, pilloried, burned at the stake, or crucified. Mankind as a group 
has made a consistently grisly game of tormenting his saviors. Why? Lack of information. Lack of knowledge. It comes from following the wrong crowd. What can we learn from all this as individuals? Two things. One, to amount to anything as individuals, we've got to be individuals. We've got to have individual goals, individual thinking, individual action. And two, we must never conform to the great mass of people. We must love them, help them, for our joy and success will be determined by the extent to which we serve them. But we must never lose our individuality and identity by permitting ourselves to be submerged in this suffocating sea of indirection and purposelessness. There's nothing wrong with emulation. In fact, it's a good idea. So long as we emulate a person who represents that which we wish to become, but never the crowd, never the 95%. We are what we think about. Our minds, our thinking, controls our destinies here on earth to a degree totally unsuspected by the great majority of people. When you think about it a moment, it becomes so obvious, so clear and simple. Believe me, if you'll do this, in five years you'll be one of the most accomplished professionals in your field, and you'll have the world on a string. You will virtually be able to write your own ticket. The average man works eight hours a day, about fifty weeks a year, for forty years. That's time enough to become great at anything. The time will pass anyway. We might as well reap the rewards. Well, then, if we become what we think about, and if we can control our minds, we can pretty well tell our own future. And that's the point I want to make. That's what I meant when I said earlier that each one of us is the architect of the structure fashioned by our years. This means that if we're confused about what we wish to become or accomplish, our lives, our environment will mirror that confusion. It also means that if we know what it is we seek, that it will, it must be accomplished. We as individuals can call our own shots for the rest of our lives. We can know what it means to go through life from one success to another, to play life according to the rules and reap the rewards. We can know what it means to have peace of mind and live calm, cheerful, successful lives. You are at this moment the sum total of your thoughts to this point, for there is nothing else you can be. And five years from now you can be and have anything you set your entire mind and heart upon. Succeeding in life has always been a matter of doing that which the great majority does not do. Now let's keep this in mind as we get into this business of gold. It isn't that I want to make an invidious comparison between the 5% and the 95%, not at all. That's just the way it is, and if we don't recognize it, it will be to our cost. At the beginning of this record, I made the statement, If you can tell me what you want, I can tell you how to get it. You see, the trick is not in achieving our goals, it is in establishing them. A ship would never leave a harbor if it did not have a destination. An industrial plant would never open its gates if it did not have a product or a purpose. Successful people are not people without problems. They have, as a rule, just as many problems and largely the same kind as everyone else. The difference is that they learn to solve their problems. Successful living is nothing more than the ability to solve successfully the problems which are as much a part of living as breathing. The degree of our success will be determined by the extent to which we can solve our problems. If you can tell me what you want, I can tell you how to get it. The problem with the great majority of individuals is not with their ability to achieve their goals in life, but rather with the failure to understand two factors vital to successful living. The first is to make the decision as to what it is we want enough to give it most of our attention until it's been achieved and to clearly define it. And the second is to fully understand that we have the ability to achieve this goal or we wouldn't want it in the first place. The next vital rule to successful living is to understand that our success is won or lost by our ability to serve others. We are interdependent, and it's just as impossible to succeed without serving others as it would be to live in our modern world without others serving us. Our rewards in life will and must always be in exact proportion to our service. It is the misunderstanding of this single law, which in my mind is responsible for fully 90% of the frustration and discontent we see around us. A lot of people don't like this law, if they're even aware of it, but not liking a law does nothing to change it. 
The basic laws of nature and economics are unchanging. If we're out of step with them, we are, as Thomas Huxley put it, checkmated. Those who know and work with the laws, he said, they are paid with the overflowing sort of generosity with which the strong delight in strength. If a person doesn't like his income, all he has to do is take a good long look at his service. Our rewards will always be in exact proportion to our service. This is the law, then, that lies as the supporting structure of economics and personal well-being, so fix it in your mind. All attempts to sidestep or in any way avoid this law will result in frustration and failure. Thank you.